it's a monolith, absolutely. And this idea that older adults can be um, heterogeneous and have lived experiences that differ from what we imagine, that older adults can be bisexual, polygamous, have HIV, age successfully, enjoy sex, like sex, all of these things feel severely discordant. Hello and welcome to the BBXX podcast, Let's Get Intimate. I'm your host, Sasha Lori, and we're here to challenge the way our culture has conditioned us to talk and think about sexuality, intimacy, and healthy relationships. To question everything, to embark on a journey of self-understanding, and to begin to rewire some of the backwards thinking that we've absorbed from the subconscious influences that have shaped us all. Our hope for you, and for myself, and for all of us here at BBXX, who are on this journey with you every day, is that through a better understanding of our own identity, of who we are, and why we are that way, we can form deeper connections with other people and live healthier, more fulfilling relationships as a result. Join us as we change the conversation and the culture surrounding intimacy and relationships. And remember that better relationships equals a better life. Today, we're going to be talking about aging, not just from the physical standpoint, but from the psychological standpoint and from the perspective of well-being. We're going to dive deep into this topic, which is one of my favorites. I truly find the topic of aging so interesting. And such as with all of our favorite topics at PBXX, it's such an incredibly important topic that is so little talked about. It's something that we're all going to go through if we have the privilege of aging, yet It's something that we know very little about. And while aging is often cast in a negative light, we also wanted to stress some of the incredibly positive aspects of the process. One of my favorite stories, one of my favorite examples of this is when I was on vacation with my aunt. And she put on her bathing suit to go to the pool and she said, you know, I definitely don't have the same body I used to, but I sure as hell feel more comfortable and more confident in my skin than I ever did when I was younger. And so my hope for this interview is that we can begin to look at aging in a new light, equip ourselves not only with the knowledge about this topic, but with the power it can give us. Our guest on today's interview is Dr. Christina Pierpaoli Parker. She's a postdoc in the clinical geropsychology program at the University of Alabama. Her research has been published in the Journals of Aging and Health, Sex and Marital Therapy, and the Clinical Gerontologist. And her writing explores psychoeducational interventions for understanding, treating, and improving sexual dysfunction in later life. Today, we talk with Christina about the pros and cons of aging. From the psychological benefits to the physical complications, we discuss sexual dysfunction, sexual liberation, the evolving role of sex as we age, how to connect deeper in our relationships later in life, and the life-changing lessons we should all learn from the wisdom of aging. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Christina. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. To start off, I'd love to have you tell us a bit about what brought you 
to where you are today focusing on this work? And why do you think this topic is so important? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you again so much for having me on the show to talk about these really interesting and under-discussed topics. I'd like to say that studying aging has really felt like an incredible privilege, not only because of the people it brings me to, but because we have nearly doubled the lifespan in the 20th century. And what that means from both clinical and scientific perspectives is that we now have access to a part of the lifespan that our own biology once precluded. And that creates vast and fertile ground for questions that we previously could not ask or answer. So I kind of have two distinct paths that got me here. One is the general path of aging and then the other sexuality and aging. So I enrolled in undergrad and for a very long time thought that I had the, the chops and the moral fiber for law school and really had intend on, intended on pursuing law. I started off as a, a poli-sci major and felt very committed to pursuing that line of work and that line of study. Fast forward to receiving a scholarship to study abroad at the Università di Urbino, which is in Italy. And I remember distinctly this moment of walking up these hills and observing these older adults walking up them aimlessly, just laughing and biking and walking. And I thought to myself in that moment, my goodness, what makes these people, this culture different from the people at home? And people in particular being my grandparents, my own grandparents who got diagnosed with Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's and let alone, you know, couldn't walk across their kitchen. And so I remember thinking and wondering, well, what makes these people different? How is it that these people are aging successfully? And my grandparents didn't. And so I returned to the States and upon returning quickly decided, well, what would be the best discipline with which to explore this problem and to ask and answer questions to solve it. And that was psychology. And so upon returning to the States, I swiftly changed my major to psychology, started doing extensive research in the area of geropsychology, so the, the, the psychology of aging. And from there, sought out additional experiences. And one included another fellowship to study at the University of Toronto where by kismet met Dr. Charles Emlett, who at the time had a large ongoing study exploring the lived experiences of older adults aging with HIV disease. And from there, having participated in that research, conducting semi-structured interview questions with adults over the age of 50 who self-identified as aging successfully with HIV, did I start to really develop and appreciate this interest in late life sexuality, in large part because this research opened me up to my own biases, but also revealed just how little we understand about aging with HIV, in large part because it was a terminal and not a chronic disease, but also how biases and attitudes towards late life sexuality sort of get in the way of promoting successful aging with HIV disease. And at that time, after that, I really, really developed an interest in sexuality in large part because it was understudied and also because the statistics were staggering. In particular, I learned that between 2010 and 2014, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found that Adults over the age of 65 saw a nearly 52% increase in chlamydia infections and a nearly 65% increase in syphilis. And most strikingly, older adults over the age of 50 account for 17% of new HIV infections. And 
by 2020, we expect that nearly 70% of all people living with HIV will be over the age of 50. And so these statistics really reveal the importance of understanding, preventing and treating um, sexual dysfunction in later life and really respecting sexuality as a lifelong process. As I was listening to some of your previous interviews and you had mentioned Stanford psychologist Laura Carstensen, listening to her TED Talk, how she talks about the fact that more years were added to the average life expectancy in the 20th century than all years added across prior millennia of human evolution combined. And so that kind of (laughs) stresses one that this is a huge change, but it's also very new. And as you mentioned, we now have these questions that previously didn't exist. Opportunities. Opportunities. Yeah. Yes. And talking about sexuality as we age, like you just mentioned at the end there, how this is something across the lifespan. I was recently listening to an interview where somebody was talking about how her name is Michelle Pullman. And she was talking about how when we're babies, we're differentiated by age. We have all these specific different age groups that are studied differently, are treated differently, have different behaviors. Yet after 50, you're just 50 plus, let alone 65 plus. That's all there is. It's a monolith. Absolutely. And this idea that older adults can be um, heterogeneous and have lived experiences that differ from what we imagine, that older adults can be bisexual, polygamous, have HIV, age successfully, enjoy sex, like sex. All of these things feel severely discordant with what we believe and have frankly been indoctrinated to believe about aging and elderhood. Yeah. And you mentioned that in Canada, in particular, working with Dr. Charles Emlett, how you kind of became more aware of some of your own biases and previous attitudes towards whether it was aging or sexuality or sex as we age. I'd love to have you speak a bit more to what you learned about yourself and what perhaps some of the more prevalent biases and attitudes that exist more in general are and how they inhibit kind of our perspective. And eventually, I mean, we will all be getting older. So how Mm -hmm. that in turn not only inhibits the way we can interact with older people, look at the way they're viewing their life, have empathy, compassion, uh, or excitement, So I want to kind of pause and break that down into a few different components. So first thing I'll say, aging is not inevitable. It is an active, privileged process, meaning it is one of the few minority statuses that we, should we conduct ourselves accordingly, will grow into. We assume that we will get older, but not everyone gets that privilege. And so I joke, but also semi-seriously say that when we experience age-related issues like pain, insomnia, nocturia, polyuria, I always joke and say that this is the tax for the privilege of aging. The inevitability of aging is an assumption that we make. We certainly would like to do that, and should we conduct ourselves accordingly, can, but it is a privilege, not an inevitability. Going back to your first question, what did I learn about myself during this research process? Most saliently, I remember thinking, oh my goodness, older adults get HIV. By extension, adults have sex and have partners and identify as anything but heterosexual. My goodness. I say that tongue in cheek, but I think this is a really important concept to illustrate, which is that in order to cultivate more positive attitudes towards age and aging, we need to promote increased intergenerational exposure 
We know that through Alport's contact hypothesis that under certain conditions, repeated positive exposures without groups, in particular, you know, minorities like older adults, facilitates and promotes increased positive attitudes towards that outgroup. And so on a you know, fundamental systemic level, our education systems, our policies, the way we design public spaces and infrastructure need to do a much better job of building in consistent and positive opportunities for intergenerational work and relationships because it is through those relationships that people cultivate more positive attitudes. And in fact, that certainly captures my experience. I grew up with very close relationships to my grandparents. They modeled for me the beauty and the privilege of aging that at a very early age, I believe I internalized. As a consequence of that, I have always sort of subjectively identified as someone older rather than younger. That is um, an interesting and emerging line of research, this question of how old do you feel versus how old you actually are and to what extent does subjective age predict uh, improved health outcome among older adults? What does it actually tap? What does the construct tell us? How can we use it and to what extent is it predictive? And so what are the consequences of ageist attitudes and beliefs? And you know, well, where do they come from? I think like most complicated things, ageist attitudes and beliefs represent a multivariate problem that has biopsychosocial correlates. For example, if you look at any media, uh, especially if that form of media talks about sexuality in any sort of material way, you'll very seldom see faces and you know older faces and older bodies in large part because we we have a disgust response, a very visceral disgust response to the idea of an older adult as sexual. And well, you know, where does that disgust come from? Well, one might argue that there may uh, be an evolutionary origin to that. This idea that sort of um, procreative potential fades with aging. And if you can no longer produce or care for a child, well, then um, your your sexual behavior really has no real function. So there could be an evolutionary origin to that. But in the modern era, we know that sexuality plays an incredibly important and positive role in successful aging. It is associated with improved cardiovascular health, improved quality of life, reduced depressive symptoms, lower BMI. And yet, many people harbor very strong negative attitudes about aging generally, but sexuality in particular. And regarding those sexual, you know, those attitudes towards sexuality, we assume number one, that older adults can't and don't have sex. If they do, it happens uh, much less frequently, is not enjoyable, and perhaps is painful. We assume that older adults are monogamous and, and, and heterosexual. We assume that they are prudent and knowledgeable and practice safe sex. And we assume that they, they know what they're doing <laughs> and that, um, <laughs> and, um, and that it is, um, done safely. But we also assume that it is in many ways unnatural or dangerous, or can cause a heart attack. And these attitudes and beliefs matter for a few reasons. One, older adults can experience internalized ageism across many domains, but certainly in the context of sexuality, whereby they assume and internalize ageist, ageist beliefs foisted upon them culturally. And as a consequence, number one, they may be less likely to ask about their sexual health. They may be less likely to have sex at all, more likely to feel guilt and shame around any sexual behavior or experience, and may be less likely, for example, to flag or tag symptoms such as, you know, fatigue or malaise 
as anything sex related. And this is actually part of the reason why rates of HIV and STIs go largely undetected, at least clinically, because both physicians and adults alike may encode their symptoms just as some feature of a, a geriatric syndrome. Oh, well, you're tired because you know, you're older or your, your immune system is a bit more inefficient. These signs get dismissed for a very long time. And the reason they get dismissed is because both adults and physicians alike assume the inherent asexuality of older adults. Another consequence of this beyond just the internalized ageism part are the clinical consequences and implications of these attitudes. We know that stereotypes and biases about aging and sexuality can trickle down into clinical practice. And we see that because physicians appear to underestimate the prevalence of their older adult sexual concerns. And beyond underestimating, um, report suboptimal history taking among older adults. There was a landmark study done in 2007 by Lindau et al. that found 38% of men and even fewer women, I believe 22% of women, were asked about their sexuality at all, at all in any way after 50. And I say because in the literature, particularly in the literature with HIV and aging, 50 is used as the cutoff because in the past people didn't live very long with HIV. But in 2020, we know that 50 is not old. So this combination of internalized ageism, systemic ageism creates a, a clinical situation wherein providers don't ask, an older adults don't share, symptoms go undetected. And in the context of a communicable disease like STIs, that can get problematic because then things can spread. But beyond just the pathology side of this, we systematically deprive older adults of the opportunity to enjoy a very important and rich part of their life, which is sexuality. Yeah, I think it's so important, again, to reiterate how these biases or self-limiting beliefs will affect ourselves, if not now, later on. And so I really loved the concept that you introduced in the beginning about it being a privilege to age and looking at it in that way and all of the kind of privileges that come with it. And now there's all kinds of science about happiness and stress levels and all of these other amazing aspects of aging, which we can get into later on. But you also introduce this concept of age as a mindset more than a number. And I often ask people, you know, how old do you feel? And I, I thought it was so funny that you think you feel older than you are because I think so often people, particularly as you get older, do feel younger than they are. And and having kind of the evidence to back that concept of you are only as old as you feel. And obviously, you know, sickness and other things come up. But I think there's a lot of power behind that to be harnessed with that kind of new reality and the new way of looking at things, again, with that new mindset and privilege. I think this slight lexical tweak, this small change in the way we narrate aging within ourselves really matters. The inevitability of aging to, again, to the privilege of aging. The reason we want to change the language with which we narrate the story of aging to ourselves really has its roots in a very strong clinical psychological principle of the cognitive triad and this idea which assumes that what we think influences what we feel and that influences what we do. And this idea that our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors have synergistic and reciprocal relationships such that one affects the other. To really illustrate this, I, I want to direct your listenership to the work of Dr. Rebecca Levy over at Yale, who has demonstrated that ageist attitudes and beliefs can predict and have associations with maladaptive health outcomes among 
adults, including Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, increased systemic inflammation. And I want to be very clear here, thinking a negative or unhelpful thought about aging doesn't causally link to those outcomes, but our cognitions can play out that reality and are mediated through our behavior. So for example, if you think that there's nothing you can do to optimize your health process, you're going to feel pretty helpless. And what we know is that when people feel helpless, they're much more likely to engage in unhelpful health behaviors. And it's through these processes, these behaviorally mediated processes, that we go on to set the stage for debility and disease. So really what you believe about anything, but in particular aging and your ability to age gracefully or the extent to which you believe your genetics influence your aging process and not your behavior can really change and influence what you do or don't do to, to achieve successful aging. I remember I was once having a conversation with someone and they were describing how they had two uncles who were only a couple years age difference and around the age of 60 to 70, one of them was still running marathons, extremely active every day. And the other one who had led a very different lifestyle and had not taken care of their their body, their mental health, eating, drinking, smoking, and how their other uncle, who was actually younger by just a couple of years, was suffering from severe dementia, was kind of physically a bit debilitated due to certain problems, functional problems in, the, in their body, and was basically just overall, if you were to look at both of them, you would have thought they were 20 years apart. And again, they were brothers. So just that kind of reminder that not only the mentality, but also the behaviors really play such a big role. And I love how you mentioned you had studied abroad in Italy, which has, you know, some of the most centenarians in the entire world. Perhaps there the mindset might be, what do you do as an 80 year old? As an 80 year old, you go get on your bike, you bike up the mountain, maybe you go to the market, you spend evenings drinking wine with your friends versus in other cultures, perhaps as an 80 year old, you are assumed to probably be in a assisted living center. You aren't, you know, drinking, having fun. You know, you might get injured if you're too active, stuff like that. And so really just having that be a prime example because I think particularly in the U.S. compared to Italy, there are just such different cultural norms and perceptions. And so bringing it back to how you mentioned kind of the way I interpreted what you said is what we deal with a lot in BBXX is trying to change the culture surrounding these things. And so it starts with our own beliefs, but our beliefs shape the conversations we're having. So not only perhaps might there be less science and research on that level about these themes, but there are less conversations about it. We're not as open to these things. And so really trying to shift our mindset so that we can shift the kind of cultural narrative regarding these types of themes. Yeah. And I think if we can start reframing aging as a health process, like anything else, that really aligns quite well with this emerging zeitgeist in our culture focused on pro-health, pro-optimization, pro-well-being. That this idea of aging aligns fundamentally with those themes. And, you know, we have to ask ourselves, well, why are we trying to optimize? Why are we trying to feel better? On the one hand, it's what we want to achieve, but on the other, we feel terrified. And so part, we have to kind of negotiate those things. Why are we doing everything that we're doing? And why do we simultaneously fear the very thing that we're trying to achieve? Those are discrepant things. There's some dissonance there. We need to address this dissonance between our commitment to health and optimization, but also our fear of aging. And the way we reduce that fear of aging will require 
a lot of things, but one, increasing FaceTime with older adults, making those interactions meaningful, productive, and pleasant, and doing that consistently in a real and substantive way on an individual, cultural, and systemic level. For example, we really need to do a better job of discouraging retirement. Retirement should be an individual's choice. It should be done on someone's own terms. And premature retirement really has associations with an incredible number of negative outcomes, socially, financially, and, 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 and health-wise. So that's just one example of where we can intervene as a culture. We need to have more older faces and workspaces. Older adults bring a specific set of skills and competencies and experiences that just by virtue of time, we don't have. And then the other thing we need to address really is the way we narrate aging as a process universally of decline, decrement, inefficiency, and loss. And we know that some things change. We know that some things get more difficult, but we also know that a lot of things improve. Sex life actually improves, okay? Older adults report that they enjoy sex more now in their 50s, 60s, and 70s than they ever did earlier in life, especially women. Women feel less concerned about their body image, which by the way, plays a major buffering role in the ability to achieve orgasm among younger women. Women and men alike know what they like, know what they enjoy, know what gives them pleasure, understand their bodies better, and over time develop better communication skills with which to share their sexual preferences. And the other thing at play here that we believe improves sexual functioning goes back to Dr. Karstensen's idea of socio-emotional selectivity. This idea that as time horizons decrease, or said differently, as we approach death, we experience a cognitive shift away from information seeking towards savoring emotionally meaningful and positive experiences. And as part of that, older people tend to prune their social networks such that the size of the social network decreases, but the quality of it increases. So as a natural extension of the socio-emotional selective selectivity process, older adults tend to report savoring their intimate relationships more and by extension, their sexual experiences, because each experience becomes sweeter in the backdrop of decreased time horizons, of imminent mortality. And that sounds scary, but it's actually one of the things that makes old age great because you worry less about things and you have fundamental perspective shift and can better focus on things that matter more. The other benefit of aging, the other thing that increases with aging tends to be overall happiness and quality of life. As we age, you know, towards the 50s and 60s, we see an overall increase in those happiness and well-being scores in large part because we've we've established our lives. Most people have found their partners, have steady income, know what they're doing professionally, but also going back to that knowledge acquisition point, over a lifespan of encountering and navigating challenges, you have cultivated a repertoire of coping skills with which to manage and challenge subsequent stressors. Emotion regulation drastically improves in later life because it's sort of this idea of, eh, been there, done that. Like I know how to handle this and I will handle this because I have proof of concept from, you know, five decades of life. I often refer to that mentality that you kind of reference at the end there as just you give less fucks as you get older, but in the best sense of that expression. And again, going back to that key part of a lot of it being about understanding yourself 
knowing who you are, knowing what your priorities are, knowing who is and isn't worth spending time with, what is and isn't worth worrying about. People know their priorities better, take less notice of trivial matters, and even have less tolerance for injustice. So as you were talking, I kind of saw this as really being about awareness and agency and helping people understand that a lot of it is about the way they approach it and that you do have more control than people are led to believe. Absolutely. Again, and I think it's so important, nuance is important because I'm not here to say aging is awesome and everything about it is great and there's nothing terrible or, or disappointing. Not what I'm saying. And um, there, and in order for us, in order for this message to be um, more palatable, we have to make it, we have to make it reasonable. And the way that we make it reasonable is by acknowledging the good stuff, which I mentioned, and that's just a sampling but then also acknowledging that things do change and that some things do get worse. We do increase in things like insomnia. We do see an increase in sexual dysfunction. We see death and we see loss and we see in, you know, an increase in the prevalence of dementia. So we have to recognize the costs and the benefits, the good and the bad, but also bridge those two things with messages of hope and agency and possibility. So that's how we start this conversation. We recognize the good things. We recognize the changes and challenges. But in the middle, we say, okay, but what are the things that we can do to prevent or manage them? And how can we start having these discussions of prevention and management early in life, right? Like when we're in our 20s and in you know our 30s and 40s, so we can go on to achieve lifespans of 80, 90, or even 100 years. And in fact, some increasing research suggests that humans have the capacity to live up to 120 years. And if that's really true, 60 is midlife, not later life. And so if we can start using this word of age sooner and start talking about aging as a health process rather than a death sentence, we can all go on to live longer and healthier lives. What we are starting to believe is that how old you feel versus how old you are is a much better predictor of health and wellness. And it's a controversial construct, subjective age, because many of its critics say, well, of course, you know, uh, it's social desirability. It's response bias. We live in a culture where we place a premium and we celebrate youth. So of course, if you ask someone, how old do you feel? They're going to endorse feeling younger, to which I say, if that's really true, and perhaps, and perhaps that is true, certainly on, on an individual level, but in aggregate, overwhelmingly, cross-sectionally and longitudinally, older adults tend to feel significantly younger. And either way, the, the fact of the matter is that kind of going back to that awareness and agency, knowing what's ahead, be it for the positive things or these negative things that do come with this process, knowing what's ahead versus kind of living in ignorance or with uh, self-limiting beliefs or according to stereotypes, yeah. that alone can change things hugely. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to take a step back a bit and talk about kind of more specifically how sexuality does change throughout the lifespan, what certain trends are, and how this has changed over the last few decades. So in terms of what tends to, to change with aging, we see a few things. Number one, I think it's worth knowing that the two biggest predictors of continued sexuality um, with aging includes the availability of a partner <laughs> and physical health. Being physically healthy and having a partner, these are the, the two, I'd say, biggest predictors of sexuality. I believe that also 
prior sexual behavior and attitudes. So people who were sexually active when they were younger tend to be more sexually active yep. when they're older. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting to see how this has played out just in terms of cohort. There are cohort differences and cohort differences just refer to differences related to the time in which you were born and raised. So those born between the years of 1946 and 64 and cohorts preceding them. So those members to the, the greatest and silent generation. And what we have found and what we observe consistently in the limited literature of late life sexuality is that boomers tend to harbor more liberal attitudes and beliefs towards sexuality in large part because of the circumstances under which they were raised. So boomers uh, versus those of the, the greatest and silent generation, for example, were, were raised during a time of recreational drug use and free love. And even more interestingly, during a time when things like penicillin were available to treat things like syphilis, which may in large part skew boomers' attitudes and, and beliefs towards sexuality, but in particular, sexual risk. And so on a group level, we see that attitudes towards sexuality have uh, tend to liberalize among boomers. And those attitudes and beliefs have played out in helpful and unhelpful ways. Helpful ways um, in, in terms of improved you know, sexual functioning and pleasure, um, more knowledge and empowerment. So uh, many older adults really would like to talk about their sexual health with their doctors. And what I found was there were these differences in cohorts, meaning that boomers were, were much more likely to say, yes, I would definitely attend a sex education program. And yes, I would appreciate if my doctor talked about orgasm with me versus people from previous cohorts, older, older generations saw the value in sex education, but were much more reluctant to discuss certain things like masturbation and how to explore their sexuality with toys and novel positions and media. So there definitely were differences that played out on a cohort level worth considering when designing, for example, a sex ed protocol or intervention for older adults, because older adults are a diverse and heterogeneous group. So from a cohort perspective, those are some changes that we're seeing. More liberalized and flexible attitudes towards sexuality, but we are also seeing an increased incidence rate of STIs and STDs. And I think it's important to pause and differentiate between incidence and prevalence. Incidence just refers to the number of new cases in a population prevalence refers to the overall numbers in a population. And we're seeing increases in both. And this idea of incidence or new cases really points to larger biopsychosocial issues. Between 2010 and 2014, older adults over the age of 65, so those boomers, saw a material increase in things like chlamydia and syphilis and accounted for 17% of incident HIV infections. And what explains that? Well, as I mentioned, this is a multivariate problem with complex biopsychosocial factors. And some of the reason has to do with those changes biologically that accompany the aging process. So aging itself can lead to increased susceptibility to contracting STIs and STDs um, because of systemic reductions in testosterone and estrogen, which can reduce lubrication, which can thin anal and vaginal mucosa, which create these tears, these micro tears, which can facilitate viral entry. And then, you know, you pair that with depressed immune responsiveness and you have a much more biologically vulnerable host. But on a psychological level, as we've discussed, we see that older adults engage in behavior that may increase their risk for infection. For example, among all the age groups, older adults report the lowest rate of condom use um, in large part because they underestimate their risk and lack knowledge about their risk. And they underestimate their risk for reasons that are, you know, maybe related to those cohort differences. So skewed sexual attitudes, 
and uh, understanding of risk behavior, having been raised in a time of recreational drug use and free love, but also these other real things like menopause and the proliferation of pro erection medication. All of that in the context of shifting dating and divorce patterns in later life. So all of that combined, and then you weave that into the sociocultural and clinical things, like those stereotypes and biases about aging and sexuality that trickle down to clinical practice that can lead physicians and adults themselves to underestimate their sexual health concerns, suboptimal history taking and provider discomfort, and then of course limited sex education both for providers and older adults that can maintain uh, dysfunctional and unhelpful attitudes, beliefs, and knowledge about sexuality. So all of that combined funnels into these increases in suboptimal sexual health outcome among older adults, but these are also rich avenues for intervention. So one invited change would be developing programs for adults and then eventually educating adults so they can educate their peers about some of the things that change with aging, the good, the bad, the ugly, what gets better, what increases in its difficulty, and most importantly, what people can do to improve their sexual health, pleasure, knowledge, and functioning. It's interesting because it should come as no surprise that the education is suboptimal considering that earlier on in the lifespan when we are given the privileged societal rank of having age groups up until kind of that 50 or 65 plus, we are still not given (laughs) optimal resources, information, and education. There is hardly any mention of pleasure being a part of sex. So I'd listened to an interview with Dr. Pepper Schwartz and she is, I believe, 72 years old and talked about how she has a fantastic sex life with her husband and has no plans to change that. And she was kind of the one who talked a lot about the fact that a lot of the people later on who weren't engaging in these types of behaviors or had more closed off beliefs, again, were people who also did earlier on in life. And it just became kind of more socially acceptable later on to be more vocal or to withdraw from those behaviors. So I'd love for you to speak a bit to process versus performance and kind of this this concept that we can apply perhaps to sex to aging in general, throughout life in general? Yeah. Process versus performance refers to this kind of set of questions you can use to orient yourself out of anxiety and out of distress. And we tend to know we are dwelling in a place of process when we are approaching whatever stimulus or challenge or activity from a place of curiosity, from a place of openness and flexibility and self-edification, seeing that thing as an opportunity to understand more about yourself and the world, as an opportunity to provide a service to another person or to the world. It's a posturing of altruism. It's others oriented and it's in the service of growth. When we are in a place of of performance, we're trying to prove, to demonstrate, to outshine, to compete with ourselves or with another. And it's in this space of performance that we develop anxiety, you know, negative affect, imposter syndrome. And so process versus performance is just kind of a heuristic, a question I use on myself and offer patients to help them take inventory of their own headspace. And very often when we are in a place of process, when we are just focusing on the doing, the experiencing, the learning, the growing, rather than on the producing the outcome, the consequence, the accolade, 
we are more creative. We are less aroused. We are less anxious. We are less paralyzed. And what that means typically is when you are experiencing anxiety about something, particularly in the context of a professional endeavor, it's typically because you're living in a, in a space of performance. You're trying to show stuff. And that's really not what it's about. We, I believe, are put here to do the most good for the most number of people. And I once heard that, and again, this is not an evidence-based recommendation, but I really like it. If you are nervous, focus on service. When we can focus on doing for others, when we can focus on using our platform to help others, to promote growth and flexibility within ourselves and other people, all of that anxiety goes away. When we focus on authenticity, there is no competition because it's just you. And when you can go into whatever space that is with that mindset, the anxiety goes away. You're seeing it as an opportunity for growth. And truly, I know it sounds radical, but we can learn how to see things as opportunities rather than threats. When you're feeling anxious about a presentation or a podcast interview, instead of seeing it as a threat, which really has its roots in a performative space, how can you challenge yourself to see this as an opportunity, to see this as a challenge, something from which you can grow, and most importantly, a vessel for communicating value to others? And when you can really focus on giving and adding value for other people in a large or small way, my gosh, you, you feel so small, but in the best way possible, that makes you free. I really think that part about focusing on self-growth, about curiosity, exploring things from the a place of curiosity is always so incredibly important and having learning kind of be the goal, I often tell people, whether it's in a job or in a relationship, that you should either be learning or having fun, ideally both. But you know, if you're doing either of the two, then that's great. But really looking at things through that form of measurement and, and really focusing on those things rather than being outcome-based, rather than, again, that comparative aspect that can be quite detrimental, if not toxic, to be constantly living on that, that hamster wheel or that, that treadmill or looking to somebody else to measure our happiness or success, et cetera. And so I loved that idea that in authenticity, there is no competition. So I just would love to, to stress to people to really try and remember that and kind of harness the power behind that mentality again, because the power of the mindset not only shapes our own behaviors, but the conversations we're having with other people. And again, that can help other people as well, not only ourselves. Uh, one thing I, I want to add, and I, I don't ever, I, I try to refrain from this binary of win, lose, good, bad. Life is, is nuanced and complicated and very seldom is there room for, for binary you know, vocabulary. But yeah. if you are trying to compete with someone else or comparing yourself to someone else in whatever way, financially, physically, sexually, if you are playing that game, you have already lost. And what I love about the process versus performance heuristic is that it very quickly reorients you. Am I in process or am I in performance? You mentioned the, the value in serving others, but I'd also love to stress how that process serves ourselves as well so much and kind of going back to that self-awareness that um knowing the, the the kind of theme of knowing thyself i'd love to ask you kind of these these last two questions what would you say 
within the context of aging, but also in general, what would you say the power of knowing yourself is? When you know yourself, you know your preferences, your needs, your values and desires. And when you know what those are, you can communicate those in real time and effectively to the people who care about meeting your needs and desires and preferences and values. And so often, clinically, especially among older women who have perpetually lived their lives in the, in the service of others at the cost of themselves, it matters to pause and to enjoy your aging and see it as a time of course, to continue serving others in the, the best way that you can, but to also sit back and reap the fruits of your labor, to sit and enjoy all of the work you have done and to now savor it. And part of that will happen naturally, biologically, but I think it goes back to you have lived your life and have deep, intimate insights into what you need and to what works. And that is more than half the battle. I can't tell you how many times people don't really know what they need, particularly younger people. Many people still need help communicating those preferences and needs assertively, especially older women who, again, have lived their lives, especially caregivers who have lived their lives in the service of others. But that's we can do that. You know, people can learn how to communicate effectively. It's not easy. It's certainly difficult, but there are certainly strategies for that. It's much more difficult to know what your needs and values and preferences are. But with aging, that happens. When we look at things within the context of sex and sexuality, the advancements in medicine become seen more as a crutch rather than something that, you know, if you have arthritis, you will obviously take medicine for it. It will improve your quality of life. Yet within the context of sex, because of stigmas, people don't seem to see things the same. And so I would love to kind of hear your view or insight and advice to people as it pertains to kind of interventions and advancements in medicine and Mm -hmm. how people might want to shift their mindset about that when it would be advantageous to use those sorts of things versus, you know, whether it's hormone treatments or certain things for women or for men, but to improve, you know, overall experience and how that plays a role in all of this that we've been talking about with kind of the process of sexuality throughout life? Sure. I think sexuality, as we've discussed, represents a multivariate problem and and multivariate problems require systems level solutions and interventions. And so first thing I say is, number one, if your sexuality is not causing distress or impairment in your life, then one might argue that we don't have a clinical problem. If it is, and sexuality does cause functional impairment for you, pain, and causes distress in your relationship with yourself or with your partner or partners, that's when we really need to recruit and apply several interventions. And those interventions will get tailored around the individual um, and the individual's need. But many things in particular, vaginal pain, for example, require traditional medical interventions or can, can use traditional medical intervention and, you know, cognitive and behavioral strategies. So sexual trauma and subsequent sexual dysfunction have very strong relationships. And so there's certainly a role for traditional medical intervention, but also for a suite of other interventions that don't look traditional, but add value including physical therapy, including consultation with a health or clinical psychologist to help give you cognitive and behavioral skills for improving your sexual functioning, including relaxation techniques, learning how to masturbate. This is a particularly large issue among older women who 
never received education about their anatomy, don't know the location of their clitoris, what function it serves, and how they can use it for self-stimulation and arousal. And that is yet another layer of intervention. Before you can be sexual with someone else, learning how to be sexual with yourself. Sexuality has been reduced or sexual dysfunction has been reduced to a medical issue. And it, it's, it's not just a medical issue. It is a psychological issue. It is a physical therapy issue. It is a pain issue. And so informed and evidence-based sexual health and treatment needs to adopt an interdisciplinary biopsychosocial approach that gets tailored to the individual and their presenting complaint. And sometimes that can include medical supplementation, right? Sildenafil, pro-erection medications, um, creams. But then very often it also includes things like psychotherapy and physical therapy and health education and the ways in which getting adequate sleep and adhering to your CPAP and monitoring your blood sugars can also have these downstream consequences on your sexual health and functioning. So when we are managing a complicated, nuanced, multivariate problem that is sexuality, we must have solutions that reflect that complexity and reducing it to medical intervention not only does the patient a disservice, but fundamentally disrespects the complexity of the problem that, that faces us. I, I really love how you portrayed so well the extent to which this is such a dynamic part of our lives and kind of it is so interwoven into so many other things. And when you did mention kind of how there are all these other causations, but also effects that feed back into the specific realm of sexuality or other kind of behavior really paints a great picture of how dynamic this is and how many options there are out there. I mean, what you just mentioned was even more than I had really been aware of. So I love that portrayal of vast, extensive options. And again, not necessarily treating a specific problem, whether it is treating a specific problem or integrating a different mindset or behavior or tools into one's repertoire to either continue such behavior to enhance, or even if it isn't enhancing, you know, getting value out of it in a different way. You know, I think one common error in thinking physicians commit and adults themselves commit is this idea that sex has to include intercourse. Sex does not have to include intercourse. And in fact, with aging, that very rigid and constrained definition can perpetuate unnecessary anxiety and distress, particularly if the mechanics of the process do change, let's say in the presence of, you know, untreated erectile dysfunction or vaginismus or vaginal pain. So one intervention, going back to this idea and of language and of using language as intervention, really involves elasticizing the definition of sex to include non-intercourse scenarios like masturbation, mutual masturbation, erotic touch, making out, oral sex, anal sex, all of these things protected, of course, still very and incredibly important to practice safe sex. But one tool that we can use to help improve sexual functioning and satisfaction among all people, all ages, but older adults in particular, who were raised during a time when sex meant intercourse, is to give them permission to elasticize that and to explore other options beyond vaginal penile intercourse, which sometimes can look different and feel different with aging. Another really important intervention beyond the ones I discussed, if you are coupled, involves learning how to dialogue with 
your partner? How do you receive love? How do you receive intimacy? What do you need to feel loved and seen by that person? And one tool often involves equipping the couple with a vocabulary and a set of tools with which to cultivate intimacy in the dyad. But one last important tool is this question of what do I do to turn myself on? How do I turn myself on? And I think an antiquated and obsolete assumption educators of your have propagated has been this idea of, well, we need someone else to turn us on. But we as women, as men, as sexual beings need to learn how to turn ourselves on. Because when your cup runneth over, you can bring that into your relationship. I think there's so much that even younger people can and should learn from all of this. And I love the idea of taking responsibility, taking ownership of your own desire and capacity for for pleasure, which again, as we're talking about the difference in, in these terms, you talked about being turned on. You're not necessarily talking about orgasm pleasure or desire are very different things than objective measurements of orgasm. And so really recognizing how empowering it can be to take ownership and responsibility of your own desire and pleasure, and also recognizing the larger picture and the the different nuances and layers of pleasure? Are you getting joy? Are you getting pleasure? Is there connection having these other types of of measurements and determinations of value? So is pleasure, sex, intimacy, this whole kind of package that we can experience not only with someone else, but as you mentioned, with ourselves. Absolutely. And it's it's actually through Um, self-exploration and and masturbation that many older women and men can go on to achieve and enjoy intimacy and eroticism with another partner or another person. But a a foundational first step off clinically often involves self-exploration, whether that is masturbation or just exploring your own body and erotic touch or finding ways of turning yourself on. And that certainly is a skill that we can impart across the lifespan because healthy sexuality starts early. And we need to continue giving permission to all people, including older adults, to enjoy that process with themselves and with other people. And I really want to echo and reinforce this idea of really valuing and respecting other outcome measures beyond orgasm. But we get into trouble when we focus on the performance of it, particularly among men who, when they enter into a a sexual encounter, hyperfixate on erection and orgasm, and in the process of trying to achieve that, debilitate themselves. Men and women alike struggle with sexual performance It looks a little bit different, but it shares common themes of performance anxiety. I think women, and I don't want to essentialize, but on the average, women tend to feel a bit more preoccupied about body image and how they look. Um, Men tend to feel a bit more preoccupied about the performance of erection and of giving their partner orgasm. And while the manifestations of those anxieties look different, I think the antidotes largely include the same things. One, learning relaxation. Two, cognitive skills to help shift focus away from orgasm and performance to process. Learning how to embody and to be with your own body 
to understand what turns you on and then communicating that and applying that into the sexual scenario, enlarging the sexual repertoire to include things like masturbation, mutual touch, erotic touch, massage, making out. And in general, the anxieties may take different forms, but the end of the day, it's still anxiety. It's still preoccupation with performance. And so for women, it's a lot of how do we start creating body acceptance? How do we start celebrating your body? How do we get you, get you comfortable with your body? And then for men, beyond the traditional medical things that we've discussed, focusing on other outcome measures, providing education about the cognitive processes at play in things like erectile dysfunction and how preoccupation with erection and orgasm gets in the way of the desired outcome and working with the male or the man, the person with a penis to develop relaxation techniques, cognitive strategies, and enlarging his own sexual repertoire to focus less on erection and performance and more on intimacy and sexuality broadly. You mentioned preoccupation with uh, the partner having an orgasm. And I was just wondering, is that perhaps something that changes over the age span? On average, I think the preoccupation with erection and performance persists across the lifespan and slightly attenuates in later life just because for the reasons that we have explained, but this preoccupation and synonymizing masculinity with erection and performance certainly represents a, a message and a story that gets narrated and told to men throughout their lifespan. And at least according to many of the patients, I, the older patients I've talked to, this need for the partner sexually really enhances the intimacy they experience as couples. So earlier in life, men's erections tend to be automatic, autonomous, and spontaneous. They kind of happen all the time. And with aging, those erections tend to happen less often and, and less independently. And one thing that many of my older female and male patients say is I actually enjoy that I need my wife or my partner to help me achieve an erection. I enjoy that I, I need that in ways that I didn't before when it, it was kind of just happening on its own because that really creates an opportunity for intimacy, for closeness in ways that perhaps didn't exist earlier in the lifespan. And so even though that preoccupation still exists, I think it looks a bit different and I think there is some more flexibility in and celebration of recruiting the help of the partner. With aging, I think we realize that sex, whether that's intercourse or not, is an inherently dynamic process and the, the, the focus tends to shift more towards the other person and away from the self. So in youth, there really is a, a larger preoccupation with feeling good and achieving the orgasm. With aging, as our brains place a larger premium on more emotionally meaningful experiences like our relationships by virtue of socio-emotional selectivity, we by extension prioritize the pleasure of the other in what we do earlier in life. And one consequence of that, incidentally, it includes improved um, and increased sexual satisfaction. A lot of what BBXX talks about and also what you just mentioned is that this self-understanding is the key to our connection with others and deeper self-understanding is what allows us to have deeper connections and more profound relationships with other people. 
kind of going off that that concept of intimacy, which is what, you know, this show and the brand and kind of building this movement around this word that used to be kind of two-dimensional and used in much more specific contexts now as what we're trying to do through changing people's thought processes and the language you we use to talk about intimacy and what it means and what its role and purpose in our life is. I would love to wrap up by having you share what your definition of intimacy is. Wow, great question. For me, intimacy describes the familiarity with and love for self and others and the deep and true belief that with closeness comes understanding, acceptance, and courage for change. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your time and knowledge about this incredibly important topic. And I hope to everybody listening, this has helped, you know, begin a a shift in your mentality, regardless of age, and will help kind of continue that that cultural shift in in the narrative at large and i look forward to continuing the conversation and talking about more of these related topics beyond just aging specifically within the context of sexuality thank you so much for the opportunity and i look forward to talking to you again soon thank you so much to each and every one of you for tuning in to listen to our show If you like what you learned and you know someone who might also like listening, please do share this podcast. You can also feel free to reach out to us anytime. If you'd like to submit questions, requests for experts to have on the show, or if you'd like to share your positive feedback or constructive criticism, we'd love to hear what you think. It's the only way we can learn and grow along with you. Be sure to check out our website, follow us on Instagram at bbxx.world, and subscribe to the book club newsletter, where we send out even more resources to help you dive even deeper to the topics that we bring to you on the show. Once again, we encourage you to take what we discuss on this show and apply it in your everyday life. Because remember, better relationships equals better life. Thank you.